Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. Um, I want to finish just a couple places uh, dealing with the synagogue of Satan that Jesus mentioned in, um, let's see, what verse was that? Revelation 2, 8 and 9. This is to the church of Smyrna. And he says in verse 8, unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write these things, saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. I remember now what I was going to study for this week and I forgot to do it. And that is replacement theology. Those who say they are Jews and are not. And I'll uh, try to remember to make some notes this week and explain what I mean. Now, are we Israel? Yes, we are Israel by adoption. We are Israel by the second birth. God had made a promise to Israel. And those who are of Abraham, those who are of Israel, are the recipients of that promise. We're recipients by faith. Does that mean then that we have replaced the Jews of the Old Testament? The answer is no. God still has a favor that he's, uh, he's got promises that he made to them and he intends to keep those promises. And I don't care what cult it is. They, they all replace Israel. Roman Catholic Church does it. Mormon Church does it. Jehovah's Witness does it. Countless others. And um, I've got a lot on that and I'll uh, try to remember to do it. If I don't remember to do it this week, God says move on. So that'll be the cue. All right. Anyway, he says, um, oh, where were we? Verse nine, I know thy works and tribulation and poverty, but thou art rich. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but of the synagogue of Satan. And we looked into that. Uh, Jesus, even though he visited the synagogues, he didn't often have nice things to say about them. And uh, let's see here, uh, John chapter 9, turn there. No, we already covered that. Acts chapter 6, that's where I wanted to go. Acts chapter 6, turn there. I remember several years ago, and I mentioned this last week, there is a lot of anti, what I would call anti-Semitic, um, ideas, anti-Semitic rhetoric out there. I'll give you a little history lesson. Uh, Henry Ford, does that name ring a bell? Who was Henry Ford? Yeah, he invented that. He's the one that figured out how to mass produce the automobile. Back before him, they were making these one at a time. They would start with one and build it until they were all done, then they would build another one. It took months. Henry Ford put everything on an assembly line, and that's where he made his money. But Henry Ford was a rabid anti-Semite. He hated the Jews. And uh, he owned, pretty much owned, the newspaper, the Detroit Free Press. And while Henry Ford was alive, he paid to have this document called the, the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion. Now, nobody knows whether this document was real, whether it was fake or what. But the Protocols of Zion basically was supposed to be a Jewish written document stating how they were going to take over the world, that the world rightfully belonged to them, and they were going to take it over. And so Henry Ford had those things published in the Detroit Free Press, when he was alive and owned the newspaper and basically could say to the guy who ran the newspaper, put this in here, I'm paying the bills. So they ran that. And then there was a guy by the name of Father Coughlin. He was a Roman Catholic priest. He also hated Jews, very anti-Semitic. 
Father Coughlin, had he been a Baptist, would have been a tremendous Baptist preacher because he had a fiery delivery. He preached like an evangelist. He preached like Reg Kelly does when he's fired up, okay? And Father Coughlin had a radio program that was funded by, guess who? Henry Ford. And it ran all across the country. And he preached constantly hatred about especially these New York Jews, these banker Jews, these Jews who want to take over the world, and these Jews who are this and Jews who are that. And um, do you remember when the movie The Passion of the Christ came out with Mel Gibson directing it? And they were accusing Mel Gibson of being an anti-Semite for making that movie because it made it look like the Jews killed Jesus, which he depicted that historically correct. Well, there was a reason why they accused Mel Gibson of being anti-Semitic. And that's because Mel Gibson's father was a known follower of Father Coughlin, this Jewish or this Roman Catholic Jew hater. And um, I could stand and tell you story after story after story of different things, different people who are extremely anti-Jewish. Um, most of the people in the Democratic Party, even though Jews are always liberal and they always vote Democrat, most non-Jewish Democrats will always vote against Israel and funding Israel and supporting Israel. So anyway, thought I'd throw that in there. So that stirred me a few years ago to study the book of Acts. And it occurred to me that the biggest haters of the gospel in the book of Acts, the ones who most fiercely opposed the preaching of the gospel, there was two different groups. One of them was the guys who ran the temples, the pagan temples, like to Diana and others. And you remember Alexander the coppersmith. He hated Paul. Why? Because Paul said, God doesn't dwell in temples made with hands and God, you can't fashion him out of copper and gold. You can't do it. So the, the uh, idol makers, there would be people outside of these temples who would make their living selling idols, religious trinkets, things that they said the gods blessed, sort of like Roman Catholicism is today. In Roman Catholicism, if you are blessed by receiving a rosary that was blessed by the Pope, they teach you that as long as you wear that rosary, you will never, ever be punished for sins. You can sin all you want to. And because this rosary or this crucifix was blessed by a Pope, then as long as you wear that, you're forgiven of all your sins. Now, those things aren't given away for free. You can imagine mafia guys who have billions of dollars would pay the church millions of dollars for one of those if they were Catholic. So that means that whatever murders they committed, whatever crimes they committed, they could get away with them and have their sins forgiven because they had a rosary or a crucifix blessed by the Pope. And it was done the same way in Paul's day. They had all these little things set up outside all these temples that people would buy these religious trinkets, these idols, these things, whatever, thinking that the gods blessed those and these guys made a fortune. And here comes Paul. Remember my analogy about the hot dog guy, the billionaire hot dog guy who wants to give away hot dogs to everybody. The guy across the street selling the hot dogs can't sell any hot dogs anymore because there's a guy across the street giving them all away. So what's he going to do? Kill the guy who's giving them away. And that's what they tried to do to Paul. They hated his guts because he was telling everybody that salvation and God's mercy is free of charge. And the guys selling it didn't like that. The Jews didn't like it. So in Acts chapter 6, look at verse 9. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines, 
and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. Stephen was the first, one of the first of the seven deacons. Stephen was a great preacher, by the way. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. And that is exactly what Jesus promised. Jesus said, if you'll not try to script out what you're going to say, I'll give you the words to say. When they deliver you up to synagogues, I'll give you the words to say that they will not either be able to gainsay nor resist. And when they realized they could not win any debates with Stephen because God had given him so much wisdom, they decided they were going to bring him up. Verse 11. When then they suborned men, which said, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. In other words, these men perjured. They suborned perjury. They perjured themselves. They lied against Stephen. Verse 12. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. And they set up false witnesses, which said, this man ceases not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council looks, looking steadfastly on him saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And then, and I would just, if I could get you to read one thing this week, week, reek, read Acts 7. Because everything in Acts 7, Stephen is teaching the typology of the Old Testament showing that it was really Jesus versus the Jews that were in Jesus' day. He talks about uh, Abraham, get thee out of thy country. He talks about Moses in here heavily. He talks about Joseph and how his brothers tried to have him killed. And that was a reference to the fact that Jesus' own family, his own brethren, his own people had him killed. Everything that Stephen said was right out of the scriptures and it was Bible prophecy through typology. And everything, and the Jews caught that. They understood that with every story that Stephen was telling from the Old Testament, it was a dig into them Jews who hated Jesus Christ. Because he tells all the stories about, like, um, if you look in verse 23 of Acts 7, and when he was full 40 years old, it came into his heart, 40, because it, it's a reference to the gospel, it came into his heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian. For he supposed his brethren would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them, but they understood not. That was a dig to the Jews. They, Stephen was saying, you Jews should have understood that when Jesus came here, he came here to save you, but you didn't figure it out and then you had him killed. And that's the same thing they tried to do with Moses. So read Genesis or Acts chapter 7. Then uh, toward the end, look at verse 54. Now remember, Stephen's in the synagogue. That's a, and it, he is exactly where Jesus said he would be. Jesus said, they'll take you before the synagogues. Think not for what you're going to say. I'll give you the words. And God gave him every... Stephen didn't rehearse this. He's on a roll here. And the Holy Ghost is giving him all these words. Verse 54, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart. And they gnashed on him with their teeth like beasts, like dogs. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped their ears, and ran upon him with one accord. And cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their coats at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. That's Paul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down, cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. 
Look at verse uh, 1 of chapter 8. And Saul was consenting unto his death. That's the same as killing him. That's what James said. Same, if you want some, if you hate somebody and wish they were dead, James said, same as murder. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. They were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Um, I'm not going to keep reading there. Turn to uh, Acts chapter 9. Verse 1, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and this is going to tell the story of Paul being saved on the road to Damascus, but basically... The synagogues sent Saul forth to have the Jews or have the Christians arrested, the believing Jews, brought back to the synagogues so that they could be tried for heresy. And we know the outcome already. They were going to find them guilty no matter what. Just like they did with Jesus. Jesus wasn't actually guilty of breaking any of the laws. And they had to find two witnesses to lie against Jesus. And when they finally did, they found out that the two witnesses agreed not with each other's testimony. They killed Jesus in opposition to the law that God gave them for taking someone's life. The two witnesses had to agree. But it was the synagogues. Um, Acts chapter 26, turn there. Verse 9. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This is Paul's own testimony. He said, I used to be on the other side. I was going to kill everybody that claimed the name of Jesus. Verse 10. Which thing I also did in Jerusalem. And many of the saints did I shut up in prison. Having received authority from the chief priest. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. How do you think Paul carried that the rest of his life? I imagine Paul always thought back to all the Christians that he had killed. He didn't kill them. But he didn't have to. He arrested them. He gave his voice of consent to having them killed. He wanted them killed. He hated them. The same way I used to hate King James preachers. I used to hate them. I thought they were ignorant. I remember we had a denominational meeting in... Um, North Carolina. And the esteemed Greek professor was going to give this lecture on the King James only issue for all the free will Baptist pastors. And I remember attending that meeting. I wasn't going to miss that meeting. I went in that meeting. It was full. The meeting room that they had set aside for that actually didn't have enough chairs in it. There was people standing up. And I remember a guy standing up next to me to give his support for the King James. He had tears in his eyes. And I can remember laughing at him, scoffing him, mocking him inwardly. You know, like what an idiot. He obviously doesn't know anything. And I'll never forget that guy as long as I live. Because I am him now. If I could remember who it was, I'd make it a point to go find him and apologize to him. 
even though he probably doesn't know that what I was thinking. But I hated those guys. To me, they were all legalists. And I just invented in my mind all these reasons why I didn't like these guys. Mike Hutzel was one of them. And I remember getting invited to go down to DeSoto Church. Mike Hutzel was preaching revival down there. It's the first time I ever heard him. And I just decided right then I didn't like the guy. And um, I didn't know it at the time, but he had heard of me. And he didn't like me very much either at the time. And the guy that gave me my very, very first conference to speak at um, supporting the King James was Mike Hutzel. He got in touch with Lonnie Burks down in Harrison, Arkansas, and Lonnie called me. He didn't know me from Adam, but he took Mike Hutzel's word for it. And uh, that was, uh, I think, the year 2000, the first time I went down there. But I know what it's like. I've been on the other side. Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples, the Lord went into the high priest and desired of him letters. Well, that's, we already read that. Actually, we're in Acts chapter 26. He said, verse 10, having received authority from the chief priest, and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Verse 11, and I punished them oft in every synagogue. That's exactly where Jesus said it was going to take place. And compelled them to blaspheme, being exceedingly mad. That means out of his mind, crazy, Adam, against them. I persecuted them even unto strange cities. And many, many such other things that are written in the book of Acts especially. Paul mentioned in the book of Galatians, I didn't read this because I want to move on to something else. But Paul mentioned that those who are born in bondage will always persecute those who are born free. Mar and right now, we are, we are clearly, clearly in a situation in this country where those who are trying to stand for what's right even if they're not born-again Christians, are going to be persecuted. If Biden's administration gains the power that they've been wanting. Let me ask you this. The Chinese government, do they favor Bible Christianity? You may not know this. You may know this. There are churches in China that are allowed to exist, but only if a government censor goes through what that minister is going to preach that Sunday and gives his approval to it. And if he don't approve it, the minister doesn't say it. There are churches in China that are practically run by the government and the ministers of those churches are sellouts. They're getting paid well. They're in favor with the elite of the Chinese government. They're promised a comfortable life and a comfortable living so long as they do not speak out against the government, as long as they do not speak out against communism. And these guys are sellouts. Meanwhile, you have real Christians, real churches who love the Lord, love the word of God, and could be thrown in prison for that one reason. Same way in North Korea. So if China continues to have its way in this country, which we know that's what's behind the cheating in the election, all of the politicians that have no interest whatsoever in what the people want, they are selling out our country and have been doing it for years. When they gain enough power, do you think we will be allowed to evangelize, speak out against them? Do you think we'll be allowed to do that? No. It is a very, very real possibility that those times are coming. Now, the next thing 
that I'm going to deal with. Back in Revelation chapter 2. Jesus said this to the church in Smyrna. He said it twice. He said in verse 8, Unto the angel of the church in Smyrna, write, These things saith the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. I know thy works, and tribulation, and poverty, but thou art rich. I know, notice he said tribulation. And I know the blasphemy of them which say they are Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Fear none of those things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may be tried. And ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. Now, that doesn't sound like Joel Osteen's positive messages. In fact, I heard this comes by way of a, another preacher that told me this. And so I can't say 100% that it's true, but I wouldn't doubt it knowing the person it's about. Um, it came from a pastor who pastors in the Tulsa area and um, Tulsa, there's a lot of charismatic churches there. And there's one church there whose pastor had a pretty good sized church. He got offered the position of being Joel Olstein's youth pastor. Now we're talking about a huge bump in salary, the prestige that goes along with that. And um, here a couple weeks ago, I played for you the Joel Osteen magic cube that you listen to every day. You put, push a button on it when you wake up and Joel Osteen gives you some positive reinforcement message. And if you listen to that commercial, they repeatedly say everything's positive. There's nothing negative. Joel telling you that if you'll just erase negative thoughts out of your life, God will give you positive results. What that's called is the law of attraction. It's witchcraft. It's what it is. It's witchcraft. Law of attraction is witchcraft. It says that if you say and think positive things, then the universe will give you positive things. But if you say and think negative things, if you have any doubt, any fear, if you say anything negative, then the universe won't, won't give you anything. If you mention the word sin, and this is what this guy was told, as going down to be Joel Osteen's youth minister, head of his youth department, I'll say. He was told in the interview, and Joel didn't interview him, somebody else, he got an office manager, told him, things you can't preach, you can't preach about hell, don't mention sin. Because those are negative confessions. If you preach about hell, you are going to condemn people to hell because you spoke negative things into their life. He believes that you literally speak things into existence. Can't mention sin, can't mention hell. Now, I, again, I know Osteen enough to know that's how he thinks. Whether or not that story is 100% true, I can't tell you that. But I know that's how Osteen thinks. And I know that kind of doctrine. Cannot, and Joyce Myers is the same way. And Melissa, you and I know a gal that we went to high school with. She worked for Joel Osteen's, or not Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers' office. She worked for her. And I heard her one time, she said something, and she said, oh, that was a negative confession. I shouldn't have said that. And I went, I know where she gets that from. Okay? It's witchcraft. Now, I'm here to tell you what Jesus told the church at Smyrna was a negative confession. It was full of negative things, but it was the truth. That church had already suffered tribulation. And they were going to do it again. Jesus promised that some of the people in that church were going to go to prison. Just for believing and preaching and practicing 
Jesus Christ and the Word of God. And he said, some of the, for 10 days, some, they're going to throw some of you in jail for 10 days. And we're not talking about county jail, federal penitentiary, halfway house. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a state park toilet. You know what a state park toilet is? It's a hole in the ground. Okay? That if you dropped your wallet in there, goodbye wallet. Okay? I'm not going in after it. That's, that's what their prison was. And he said, be thou faithful unto death. You see, Osteen and Myers, they don't even use the word death. Have you ever heard them use the word death or dying or die or be killed? Or They don't because they believe. He really does. He believes that if he talks death to his people, he will speak death into their life and they'll die. Number one, he's stupid. Number two, he's not God. Number three, it doesn't work that way. He's the kind that would say if he was, ex if he had COVID, like we had COVID. Well, Melissa, it was your fault because you made a negative confession because you said, I ache everywhere and I'm freezing to death. Well, that, that's because you spoke pain into your body. It's your fault. But see, Joel Osteen would, and Joyce would have her say, I am healthy, I am alive, I am well in Jesus' name. But that's a lie. They want you to speak lies in hypocrisy. That's what that's about. Anyway, tribulation. Turn to John 16. I grieve sometimes. I grieve. I worry. I worry about, number one, myself. Number two, I worry about people. People who don't take their Christianity seriously enough. To them, it's a secondary part of life, not primary, not the first thing, not who they really are. If something comes between them and the Lord, then it's whatever that is first and the Lord second. And I submit to you that tribulation, when it comes, is a device used by God to separate those who really are and those who really aren't. John chapter 16, verse 32. Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own. And shall leave me alone. Now, I don't know everything. I don't know all the reasons why. Back in September, when a large portion of this church got sick. But what, what effect did it have? It scattered everybody. It made everybody... Alone. What's the devil looking for? If he sees a, what are the lions looking for when they're around a, a herd of uh, water buffalo? Lions and water buffaloes have a little thing going. Water buffaloes, when they're in a herd together, they don't let the lions anywhere near them because there's strength in the herd. Lions. Don't approach a herd of water buffaloes because lions know those horns, male and female water buffaloes both have horns on them. And those lions know that those horns can kill them. 
And those water buffalo, those big ox, they're heavier than they are. They can stomp them to death. Lions know that. So the lions know that their best chance of getting one of those water buffaloes is by doing what? Chasing the herd, separating out the slowest one, get one of them separated, and you've got five lions on its back, it doesn't stand a chance. Doesn't stand a chance. Look at what he said. The hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered. And the devil knows that. Every man to his own and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because the father is with me. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. Now I'm somebody that there are days when I desperately need peace. I always end up some days a lot of turmoil, a lot of grief, a lot of worry, a lot of guilt. My only remedy is to go to the Word of God and find peace. But then he said, in the world, ye shall have tribulation. I mentioned this last week, I think, that there is a threshing tool. I don't know what it looks like. I imagine it has three teeth on it. But it's used to thresh grain what it does somehow some way is it rubs the chaff off of the wheat or the husk off of the corn it rubs it off and separates it out because who eats chaff except for wheat bread which i don't really like wheat bread they always put that chaff back on the top of it they say oh that's good for you i don't know or like popcorn when you eat it and you get it hung in this tooth right here, right? But that tribulum, that tribulum, that threshing tool was designed. Remember what Jesus said to his disciples? Satan desires to sift you as wheat. To work against you, to cause heat and friction, to cause trouble. If you're looking for a word in the Bible related to tribulation, it is the word trouble. Because you'll find them often together. In the world ye shall have tribulation. But think about the illustration. The chaff is this flesh, this body. The thing that we don't like about ourselves. The thing that tries its best to keep us from serving God. The spirit and the soul in me is that which bears the new man in me. So when tribulation comes, it has the effect of getting our flesh out of the way. So we can serve God the right way. So he said, in the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Turn to Acts 14. Somebody have to tell me when to quit. I don't know who's ringing the bell today. Acts chapter 14. Verse 21. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra, to Iconium and Antioch. Confirming the souls of the disciples. Why do you have to confirm them? Because some people say they follow Jesus, but you find out after a while that they really don't. So they confirmed the souls. That means they taught them doctrine, taught them what to expect, told them that, yeah, God's going to give you great peace. He's going to give you joy, but... Some bad things are going to come as well. Exhorting them to continue in the faith. And, and why did he say that? That we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Now I've got 
friends in the ministry that would disagree with me on the issue of the tribulation. And that's neither here nor there. I love them. I would never, never try to contradict them. I'd never, never want to lose my friendship with them over it. But even if we were not going to go through some prophetic time called tribulation, you can guarantee, according to John 16, according to Acts 14, that in this life, not every day is a bowl of roses, is it? Mm -mm. When I was, um, when I was at home sick with the coronavirus, feeling lousy, there was some nights I just couldn't sleep. I felt so bad I couldn't sleep. And I've had this movie that I'd bought like, a couple of years ago, I never watched it. And it was about Paul the Apostle. It had just been recently made. And I watched that movie and it was what it was. It was about the last few weeks of the Apostle Paul's life. He was beaten. He was nearly starved to death. Here I am feeling bad anyway. Now I'm watching the Apostle Paul's sufferings in film. And I'm just going, I probably shouldn't be watching this. Today's not the day. But I finished watching it. You know where Paul is now? It's in heaven. Greatest place in the world to be. But did he suffer to get there? Absolutely. Maybe... I don't know, maybe he suffered more than what most of us would have to suffer. I don't know. I just know that living down here is going to bring suffering and trouble and tribulation. It's going to bring it. Good morning. Romans chapter 5, turn there and then we'll dismiss. Romans chapter 5. Verse 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. If you're looking for peace in this world, you're not going to get it. If you're looking for TV shows to bring you happiness, I give up on that a long time ago. If you're looking for books of this world, if you're looking for earthly friendships, if you're looking for anything in this world to bring you peace, you're never going to find it. The only real peace that you're going to have when you need it the most is the peace that comes from the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. We have peace with God and you may be fighting the world, but at least you're not fighting God. Somebody say amen. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing, and here's, here's what I said earlier, tribulation has a purpose, it has a work that it does. It has, God lets us go through it for a reason. Because we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience. We live in a world now where everything's delivered to us. We want faster internet speed. We want to drive in the fast lane. We want our food delivered quicker. We want everything now. But we don't learn patience. One of the things that I've had to learn and still learning as a pastor. Learn to be patient with people. Learn to long suffer with people. Learn to pray for people and not demand instantaneous perfection from people. Not demand that they all live right as soon as they get saved or as soon as they pray or whatever. But to be patient with people. 
The same way that God deals with me, the same way God deals with them. He brings them troubles. He brings them hardship. Why? So he can teach them patience. And then patience, experience, and experience, hope. And what that means is, since I already know, Philip, how God delivered me the last time, and that he did deliver me the last time, that's how I know he's going to do it again. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. We thank you for it. We ask God, Lord, to fill our hearts with patience and teach us, dear God, how to hold fast, how to hold on. How, dear God, to put our trust in you instead of our trust in this world. Knowing, God, that hard times will in fact come. We ask your blessings on your word. Bless this uh, morning service, we pray in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen.